This is John with the Active Towns Podcast, and I'm absolutely delighted to have in the podcast studios here for Active Towns, Jasmine and Patrick, welcome to the Active Towns Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, fantastic. Well, Jasmine, I'm going to have you kick us off here and uh, just take a moment to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your journey to the the Oh The Urbanity YouTube channel. <laughs> Sure. Uh, so yeah, we started a YouTube channel called Oh The Urbanity. Um, I believe it was in uh, June 2020 or around then. Um, just uh, we had recently moved to Montreal uh, from Toronto and uh, we were just pretty enamored with much of what we saw in uh, in that city. Um, a lot of what we saw was different from other Canadian cities that we'd lived in, um, which I'm sure we'll get into in this conversation. Um, and it kind of inspired us to just share our experience of, of moving around the city, uh, walking and biking. Um, and, and yeah, and here we are <laughs> a couple of years later. A couple doing years that. later. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So tell us a little bit about your background. Um, I, 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 you know, I'm not sure if you're, you're like steeped in, in urbanism and planning and architecture and design and transportation. Uh, you know, where did you come from? What's your background? Right. Um, so I'm actually um, an English major. Um, I was pretty interested in um languages um, growing up and then through through university um, and spent a lot of time studying French as well. So that was another um, super appealing thing about moving to Montreal and living there. Um, but in terms of um, urbanism background, um, both of us are, are pretty uh, self-taught, uh, just became kind of passionate and interested in it. Um, more recently, like when we, we both actually um, grew up in urban area or urban areas, <laughs> rural areas. Um, so moving to cities was, I guess, like sort of uniquely exciting to us. And that kind of inspired us to, um, you know, look more into it uh, from different facet, f facets and um, delve more into the research and stuff. But no, no uh, professional background. Interesting. That's fantastic. Now, you, you mentioned a rural area where you grew up. Yeah. Uh, uh, those terms mean different things to different people. Uh, where did you grow up? And when you say rural, what, what do you mean by that context? Yeah. Um, so I grew up uh, north of Waterloo, um, Ontario, um, and it's, it was a small, uh, small village. Um, so not, not not like a farm Um but still, it, like driving was pretty normal to do most of your daily activities. Um, uh, yeah, so not the most rural, I guess, but uh, it's a very small town feel. Fantastic. That's great. That's that's interesting. That's fascinating. So, yeah, I so I actually grew up on a on a ranch, a small ranch. And so uh, similar to Chuck Marone, who uh, grew up on a farm uh, in, in Brainerd, uh, Minnesota, you know, we have that that sort of your true rural kind of, uh, you know, uh, background. But it sounds like yours was a little bit more of a, a rural sort of small village, probably surrounded by a lot of farms. Is that right, about right? Exactly. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Fantastic. A lot of farmland around. Yep. All right. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, Patrick, mm. we're kicking it over to you. Tell us about your background. Where'd you come from? So I grew up also in a small town rural environment in uh, Nova Scotia on the east coast of Canada, about an hour north of the uh, city of Halifax. And yeah, very similar experience of a lot of the things that people in the city take for granted, like public transportation and the ability to walk places. That was just fundamentally fascinating coming from a small town rural environment. Like you can... There is some level of walkability in, in small towns for sure, but you're dependent on a car in a way that you aren't necessarily in the city. And that is a lot of what makes cities fascinating to, to us for sure. Um, in terms of uh, background aside from that, so I also don't have any professional background in urbanism. It's just uh, just an interest of our, of our, experience, of our experiences of uh, exploring cities and, and looking into research and whatnot. I also have a background in the languages, so I have a, a PhD in linguistics, and that has given me quite a bit of good background for um, research and stats and some of that side of our channel. And that's, yeah, a, a big part of what interested us about moving to Montreal. So we had lived in Toronto for a few years, and the, the, the main things that drew us to Montreal uh, were the, it being a French-speaking city, primarily French-speaking city, and wanting to get better at French 
And then we had visited quite a few times before Montreal. And we knew that we just liked the urban environment, the, the, the more traditional uh, city design of uh, denser, denser housing on a less car oriented um, transportation network. And we knew that we liked that sort of environment. And then it was after we moved to Montreal that we really experienced it more in depth and decided to say, hey, this is a, this is a really unique place in North America for urbanism. And one of the I guess, themes of our channel is that there are a lot of urbanist successes in North America. So lots of people like to point to the Netherlands, Denmark, other places in Europe. And obviously those places do, you know, bike culture, public transport the very best. But we also have a, a lot of examples in North America to point to. And so we were especially uh, impressed by the bike culture in Montreal. And, uh, and also we found the, the housing situation there very interesting. They have a lot of the, I guess you'd say, missing middle, what would be considered missing middle housing in, in other parts of North America, in between the detached home and the, and the tall buildings. They have the you know, three to four story walk-up apartments. And that's uh, also something we've showcased on the channel. Yeah, fantastic. And 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 I, we're, we're going to talk extensively about some of the content that you guys have out on your channel and and really, uh, you know, give uh, folks who are new to to your channel a, a little intro to it <laughs> and all that good stuff. It, so it sounds like you both had, you know, that that commonality of, you know, the smaller you know, sort of ver- rural vis- village uh, type of thing. I can remember, you know, even though, you know, our, our ranch was about two to three miles outside of the city center, the village center. And at the time there was only like 4,000, you know, population or whatever, but, and it was a small country road to get in, but all my friends who lived in town, it was inherently very walkable and bikeable uh, just because the distances were so so short and the traffic volumes were pretty low. Was that similar to your villages? Yeah, I, I would say thinking back, I started biking to school in, grade four. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And it was, yeah, because you don't have, like, it, it was a car oriented place, but it wasn't like a six to eight lane suburban arterial road. Right. Right. Um, yeah. You, you could, you could bike on the sidewalk as a kid and yeah. be like relatively fine. Like it, there's definitely room for improvement, right. but it, it, it was more, it, it was somewhat more naturally um, accessible to, to, to walking and, and cycling than a, than a suburban area would, even though in some ways they looked similar, right? you know, with like detached houses and large lawns and, and, and whatnot. But yeah, it was, that, that definitely, um, that was definitely an influence and the excitement that you have when you're in grade four and you bike to school, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that probably had an impact, a long-term impact. Yeah. It's yeah. hard to, it's hard to say for sure, but yeah. How far, how long do you think that journey was? How long did it take you? Oh, that was a while ago. Yeah. Um, and time changes for yeah, for us. You know, what seemed like yeah. maybe forever was like, oh, yeah, that was like 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, maybe 20 to 25 minutes. I'm, it, it's yeah, hard pretty to decent remember. distance. Yeah. 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 How about you, Jasmine? Were you, were you able to get around in your town where you grew up? Yeah. Yeah. It was probably pretty similar to Patrick's experience where you mm-hmm. could, you know, walk to the corner store or mm-hmm. the hardware store. Like there yeah. were some shops that you could walk to. Um, but then it, it depended a lot on where you went to school um, right. or, you know, where your job was, whether or not you have to hop in the car every day. Right. Um, yeah. Which we did because our school was about 20 minutes uh, drive uh, away. So, OK. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Mm-hmm. And was that a uh, just a function of not enough uh, population to, to support, you know, the shorter distances? Um, there was a school in in my in the village that I lived in. It was just my parents wanted to send us to a different school. Got it. Yeah. Um, so, yep, yep, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in, in, in a recent conversation I had with Darcy Kitching, uh, she talked about that, you know, some of the, the the ability to have school choice, you know, in Boulder, Colorado, right. really influences uh, an increase in motor vehicle traffic, uh, you know, to and around schools as as parents are sort of customizing their kids education and to schools and there's obviously pros and cons to to that and and obviously one of the cons would be an influx of cars coming right to the the school location 
Yeah. Right. So yeah, you, for you sure. got to experience that personally. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you ride the cheese, cheese bus, as they called it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I, I want to shift gears and talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of your, your, your journeys. Now, when, when you think back to um, that sort of that moment when um, you, you, you sort of like started thinking about the urbanism you, you'd mentioned that you started the channel in 2020 um you, july right 2020 i think so yeah, yeah june, june or july june yeah. or july right in that mm-hmm. time frame so we're in the midst of the pandemic <laughs> so yeah. what was what was that event that really was just like yeah we need to do this we need to start talking about this look backwards in time just a little bit before you started the channel. What, what got you thinking about, we need to talk about this. What was the aha moment for you? So we actually kind of started out talking about learning French in Montreal. Uh, we did some videos on, on, you know, is Montreal a good place to learn French, um, things like that. And, and, and that was, I guess what really got us started, but we were also thinking about, um, so summer of 2020, you do a lot of biking, bike trips because uh, because of the pandemic. And a lot of our very early um, videos were on bike trips around the Montreal region, like day trips, weekend trips, things like that. Um, it's less what we do now because um, it's it's more of a local interest. But that definitely got us started in the uh, in, on YouTube, and then we kind of shifted from talking about French in Montreal and bike trips around Montreal to talking about urbanism more generally, housing and transportation, and yeah. Interesting, okay. Um, is there, for Jasmine, for you, was there like a, a moment in time, whether it was in Montreal or any of the other cities that you were in, where you were just like, this was the aha moment that there's there's something here that we need to be talking about? Um, I think it was more of a gradual um process than that. Um, I think another thing that kind of inspired us was watching other YouTubers like tell Canadian story, like not necessarily Canadian stories, but people who are based in in Canada who are doing similar things like um, RM Transits and Paige Saunders were big influences on us just talking about like, um, just I guess like active transportation, transportation in general, um, what it's like to live in a Canadian city. Um, And it just, I think, like, kind of lit a fire under us a bit, like, made us think, well, well, if we if we had to tell a story, how would how would we tell it? And what would our perspective be on these topics? And then that was kind of coupled with like our passion for biking around and walking around and and also just being like really excited about being in Montreal. And I think it just kind of um, was like a cocktail that um, ended up with us starting to make videos, I guess how I would explain it. Yeah. And, you know, and I know you've lived in, in, in various different cities. You're, you're currently in Ottawa now, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Okay. And uh, where does Toronto uh, come in, come into this equation? So yeah, Toronto was um, where we had really tried to get into biking around because we were in a context where we had lots of different destinations that were in very reasonable biking distance, like you know two to five kilometers, perfect distance to bike. Um, but you know we, we tried a few times, but it, it's hard to understate just how awful it is to bike in traffic especially when you don't have any experience biking. Right. It's just like, it's a thoroughly unpleasant experience. And we, we, we tried a few times and just got discouraged. And yeah, it was, it was just, it, yeah, it's, it's hard to understate how bad biking and traffic can be. <laughs> mm-hmm. Jasmine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> having, having, having flashbacks now. <laughs> um, but in, a, in other ways, it's, uh, it made us a lot more more confident as uh, cyclists in a mm-hmm. city and like taught us how to take the lane when you have to and yeah. um you know make sure that you're visible and you're not going to get cornered by a car um right. or a truck um 
So I think we took a lot of practical skills away from that experience, um, even though it was traumatizing at times. I was going to say, <laughs> and traumatizing. And in, in fact, yeah. it's the infrastructure was forcing you to behave like a vehicular cyclist and, and rather than being able to lean upon uh, an all ages and abilities network that is truly safe and inviting for everybody. So, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, Toronto does have some, you know, some parts <laughs> that are better and uh, and 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 truthfully you know in north america in a north american context uh you know clearly montreal and, and vancouver are probably leading the pack uh but toronto does have some protected infrastructure in the downtown area they you know have have had uh, you know some infrastructure talk a little bit about uh, how long did you guys were you in in toronto Five, six years. Oh, wow. So some time. So did yeah. you see a transformation over those years in terms of an enhancement yeah, and improvement? Okay. Uh, yeah, so this shot here is of uh, Bloor Street, and that's near where we lived. And we were there when they put in a pilot project mm-hmm. to introduce these, these, these bike lanes here. And it was it covered maybe three kilometers, which is not especially impressive, but it is actually it was actually very useful for us in terms of connecting us to different places, like to the university where where I went and to different parks and, and shops and stuff. So having the, these Board Street bike lanes be um, be implemented was very important in helping us develop comfort in biking around the city. Like it seems so simple, but just having bike lanes to 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 start using. It, it even helps you develop confidence to bike in traffic. Um, so we, you know, we biked fairly often on, on, on these lanes. And then, you know, that gave us some level of confidence and, and comfort in the urban cycling environment. And so the, the Board Street bike, way, bike lanes were a pretty big factor in us getting uh, more, into, more into cycling. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that you, you you talk about the the fact that you know having this infrastructure you know helps give you a little bit more confidence to be able to uh, deal with uh, environments that are a little less <laughs> inviting. Uh, Jasmine, for you personally, how, how you know how did that sort of manifest itself? Was it just the fact that you were able to ride more frequently, and therefore you wanted to ride more frequently, and and therefore have a little bit more confidence over time? Yeah, I think so. I think just knowing that you have a, a like a route that, that you're aware of even that will be partially protected right. is a very big uh, factor. Um, you know, you just you just know, oh, I just go out to this this major road and then I'm I'm OK. And um, I guess like slowly you you start like developing your own roots um, and knowing where to go and stuff. But I think, yeah, having that major artery there. Um, that will take you to a lot of useful destinations, like Patrick mentioned, is, um, yeah, really, really big factor. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's good stuff. Mm-hmm. So when you look at your, your 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 transition, so it was Toronto, then it was Montreal, then Ottawa. Is that how it went? Yep. Okay. What prompted the move from from Toronto to, to Montreal? Was it you know, diving into the, the language stuff and, and job related? So that was, um, I just finished up uh, my degree at the university and we had our uh, sublet, our lease um, expired. Uh-huh, so we okay. had to move somewhere. We had to move somewhere. Yeah. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was a mixture <laughs> of Montreal being appealing for the French, okay. being appealing for the urbanism and it being much more affordable than Toronto. Oh, okay. Because um, okay. Toronto is, uh, is quite an expensive city to live in. Um, Montreal is getting worse, but it's, but it's still better than Toronto for, for affordability. So those... Those three factors uh, drew us there, and we knew that we just wanted to live there for at least some period of our life. Yeah, uh, yeah. because we had visited so many times before, and we knew it was such an appealing city for us on so many different dimensions. Yeah, that, that, that's to, exactly what I was going to ask. Is like, had you been visiting? <laughs> you know? Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. All right, great. Mm-hmm. So, um, Jasmine, for you, you know, what, what was that? What was that move like? I mean, I, I've visited both cities. I haven't spent a lot of time there, but I would think that culturally it's a little bit different too. Yeah, uh, it definitely is. I guess 
having a lifelong interest in in French and really liking Montreal, yeah. um, it kind of felt more natural to me. Like, I guess I feel like I have a bit of the, <laughs> that French culture in my uh, in my blood, maybe. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it didn't feel. Yeah, it, it felt exciting, okay. really, f- for me. Like um, and, and there are aspects where you where that challenge you like um, obviously not being a um, like completely bilingual. Um, make, make some interactions harder. And like, that's part of the excitement for me, but also it can, it can be challenging. Um, and you can beat yourself up a little bit if you feel like you're not performing well as speaking French. Um, (laughs) so, so things you kind of have to keep in check, I guess. Um, uh, so yeah, challenging in, in some ways, uh, but also like really rewarding and just really fun to, to be there and experience kind of how people live there and yeah and the Mm -hmm. image that we have here of course is is of the uh the cycling infrastructure and uh what was that like for you okay so you're leaving toronto and we have that horrendous image of all the cars on uh, you know there at the at the blur intersection and then we kind of go to the next level of there's this improvement but then you get into montreal which arguably has one of the most well built out um at least cycle track uh two-way cycle track network in north america uh what was that like for you jasmine you know making that transition from toronto to to montreal you know at least from a comfort perspective how how did that feel for you uh really really awesome honestly um it's uh yeah it just made everything so much easier (laughs) um in a lot of ways. And we lived in the the plateau, which is, a, which is a, probably the best area for cycling too. Um, so that made a big difference. Um, yeah, it feels safer. You see, you see a lot more different types of people out cycling all the time. Um, you know, more families out. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just normal, I guess there, like it's a lot more normal to hop, hop on your bike. Yeah. Um, so you, so yeah, you feel like invited and and you feel you feel like one of the normal ones there, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. this is like a, a fun little uh, overhead shot of you know these the, the the unique housing types that are you know part of the, the Montreal thing, and and a lot of your content that you uh, you know create is is you know hence the name oh the vanity <laughs> is urbanism related. Uh, talk a little bit, Patrick, uh, about this particular image and why it resonates so profoundly with you. So in in much of North America, we think of housing like you, you live in a detached suburban style home or you live in a high rise condo or apartment tower. And we've kind of lost the sense of there being a middle ground between those and those types of housing like they can be perfectly fine in many contexts. But it's also interesting to look at, you know, what does uh, dense but short housing look like, like, like what you find in, in much of Europe. But yeah. it's just kind of outside of our consciousness in, in North America. And Montreal is, um, as, a, as an older, um, you know, eastern city, you know, city on the, the east coast, um, and having a somewhat different cultural background and influence, it is, it's mostly these types of missing middle um, this type of missing middle housing. So most people live in, you know, two to four story small apartment buildings called uh, plexes, and they have lots of interesting characteristics. Um, most people notice the external staircases on, on, on the front, and you can't quite see them that well in um, in, in this shot. But it's a, it's a very unique experience walking down the street and seeing all these external staircases, mostly mostly metal. Um, they're kind of dangerous in the winter. But they, they serve a, a unique purpose of um, or an important purpose of uh, of letting most of the units have their own front door. Right. So there's no uh, for for most of these apartments there's no um, there's no common lobby. You just yeah. have your your own direct front door, which is a, a cool it, it's a cool balance between the the density of um, of, of, a, of a taller building with uh, the personal space and independence, let's say, of a, of a of a more spread out uh, type of housing. It's yeah. a whole middle ground, and we think that other cities in, in North America could uh, could take some inspiration from from Montreal housing. Yeah, you, you use the D word, 
density. density. Yeah. <laughs> I, I look at this and I think, uh, I do think of European cities, I think of Paris and, and other places where that concept of gentle density, in other words, you don't have to go directly from a single family home to a, a 30 story, you know, uh, luxury condo complex or, or, you know, 17 story, uh, low income housing, you know, apartment complex. I mean, there's, there's this wonderful aspect. You mentioned the, the term missing middle. There's this missing, you know, middle zone of anywhere between, th- you know, three, four, all the way up to, you know, five and six stories in, uh, in Paris. You see that a lot. And, uh, Ian Gale in his book, um, uh, Oh, Cities for People, I think, is the actual name of it. You know, he talks about that six six stories being what that sort of upper limit where you can still go out on your balcony and then make eye contact with people on the street and you can see facial expressions still. So it's of it seems like it's built at human scale. So when I looked at your your image that you sent through, I just smiled ear to ear. <laughs> I was like, yes, that's awesome. It's And it's one of the most... Um, wonderful and beautiful aspects of Montreal uh, that, you know, and I've, I visited in the summertime for um, the uh, cycling events that they had. So the Tour de uh, Louis and, and Tour de, de Ile, uh, you know, the Friday and Sunday events. Uh, fabulous. I'm, I'm, suppo- I'm thinking that you're, you're nodding, Jasmine. You probably mm-hmm. uh, were able to participate in those events or at least see them. We didn't, but yeah, I've heard of heard about them. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. I mean, the entire community comes out and, and supports it and just thousands, tens of thousands of people on bikes really launching. It's always held in June, uh, typically held in June. Uh, last year, they had to do it in August because of the pandemic. But uh, it's like they call it the kickoff to the cycling season there in um in the Montreal area. Uh, the other word that you s- that slipped in there, uh, Patrick, was uh, the W word, the winter word. <laughs> so uh, a-, a lot of people don't, you know, really realize that, uh, yeah, people ride bikes in the snow. And uh, Jasmine, talk a little bit about, you know, did you keep riding, you know, in, in the snow in, in the wintertime there in Mar- Montreal? Yeah, we, it was actually our first, um, our first real winter riding took place once we had moved to Montreal. Um, we, we just saw, we, yeah, we saw people doing it and it became, um, possible. <laughs> like we noticed right. that it was possible. Um, so yeah, we, um, we actually got, uh, we got folding bikes and, uh, that allowed us to be a little less precious about, um, you know, getting our bikes dirty or, or wear and tear. Um, and then we, yeah, we took some, some rides in the winter and it was very doable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. And uh, yesterday, uh, we're, we're recording this on Saturday, uh, June 11th. And yesterday on uh, Friday, the, the 10th, I uh, did a, a wonderful premiere with uh, Pekka uh, Takola from uh, Olu, uh, Finland. And so we talked a lot about uh, winter riding. And he has a wonderful YouTube channel that we'll make sure that we have a, a link to in the, uh, in the show notes in the description uh, below to his channel as well. But they talked a lot about how they really try to make sure that on the winter maintenance perspective, they dial it in so that you don't see that huge drop off of uh, participants, you know, being able to feel like they're, uh, they're, in, you know, taken care of. Patrick, speak a little bit to that from your perspective. Um, how well is Montreal doing in terms of, you know, I- encouraging people to continue cycling? in the winter uh, by maintaining the uh, cycle tracks, uh, you know, when it gets snowy and icy and all those challenges. And I'll bring that image back up so that uh, you have something to speak to. (laughs) Yeah. So in our neighborhood, at least, which is what we had the most experience with, they did a pretty excellent job. Um, So it's probably not comparable to to Olu, which is the the, the world capital for, for winter maintenance and winter cycling. But from a North American perspective, they did a, a very good job of, of keeping the, uh, the bike network uh, clear. So this here is the, the new Rev um, Express Bike Network on uh, St. Denis. Yeah. And they have, they basically use the same type of plows that they use for the sidewalk to, to, to plow the, uh, the, the bike lanes as well. And they would, they would be plowing like in the middle of the snowstorm, they would be plowing. It was, it was done so fast and it was, it was very impressive. And honestly, having, Having the bike lanes plowed is 
everything in terms yeah. of being able to to bike in the winter. Like there, you know, there's some challenges. Like it's cold. That's not very pleasant. But like we handle all of those challenges with when we walk in the winter by you know, gloves, hats, coats, all that stuff. So we know how to handle those things. Right. It's the, it's the, the maintenance. It's, it's being able to have a clear bike lane. That is the, the, the key to actually being able to actually being able to, uh, to go out there and bike. Yeah. And we, yeah, we were pretty impressed by the, um, by, by the maintenance, but also just the, the culture of, and as dad's would mentioned, when you go out there and you see people biking in the winter yeah. that shows to you that it's possible. So we lived pretty close to, to, to this, uh, this road here. And basically every time you walk along the road, like you will see multiple people biking in the winter. Like yeah. the, the volumes aren't the same as the summer, but like you will not, you, you cannot walk down this road in the winter and think that, it, you know, winter cycling is impossible. You just can't yeah. do it. Yeah. I think, uh, uh, so it's very true that the, the maintenance of bike infrastructure is very good in Montreal. Um, but another thing to note is that like not all winter days are the same. So like, even if you don't want to bike in a snowstorm, there are many days where like the conditions are dry and it's like for all intents and purposes, um, you know, like a fall or a spring day with just some snow on the side. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess that's that a, was, that's that a was great it. point. That's a great point, uh, Jasmine, because if we look at this uh, image here, we see that it's a nice, beautiful bluebird sky day and it's and it's sunny. A big difference between, you know, like you said, a stormy day where you're being yeah. pelted by you know freezing rain or ice or something right. like that. So the other yeah. thing that I want to point out about this, uh, this photo, which is really kind of a cool thing, because, you know, some people might be looking at that going, oh, my gosh, that that cycle track doesn't look at all usable. There, there's like literally snow on the track itself but what the key thing is is your those you know heavy duty chunks and those stuff that would really if you hit it it would be um you know a problem that has been maintained and has been pushed off to the side second thing that i want to mention about this particular facility the rev is that they built it so incredibly wide yeah, they knew <laughs> they because you have to have a place to, you know, when it gets deep, you have to have a place just like this uh, photo uh, indicates to pile that snow. Uh, and as you can probably tell, even though I live in, in uh, Austin right now, I have lived in uh, snowy places, <laughs> including <laughs> Chicago and Boulder. So mm -hmm. I, I do have uh, uh, an appreciation for that and riding right. a bike in those areas. So how long uh, did you end up staying in uh, Montreal? Just under two years. Okay. Just under yeah. two years. And I realize when I, with us English first speaking people, we say Montreal. Uh, in French, do they, is it more like Montreal or something like that? Uh, Montreal. No, Montreal. There we go. Fantastic. <laughs> I had, I interviewed uh, Jean-Francois and I don't remember his last name on that, but he was a wonderful tour guide uh, uh, there in, in, in Montreal. And, and he, it was so beautiful how he would, you know, speak that. And he was very gracious of speaking to me at the end to, end to our group in English the whole time. But uh, you could tell English was a second language for him. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you were there, you were immersed in, in that environment for, uh, a, a good you know two plus years and uh, you were able to get your French fix and then you decided <laughs> hey okay we're gonna move cities again uh, what prompted the uh, the move to uh, Ottawa we moved to Ottawa for a job opportunity yeah basically yeah, <laughs> <Very straightforward. laughs> yeah it was, uh, it, it was a, a job that fit my uh, skills and, and background well enough that it was hard to say hard to say no to moving even though we loved Montreal so much, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was hard to turn down. It would have been yeah. hard to turn down. So, and part of that move then features, uh, a, another shift and a change in, uh, infrastructure and cycling infrastructure. Talk a little bit about what that change is like, uh, Jasmine, for you in terms of, you know, the, the differences in, in the type of infrastructure that you see, uh, and is most prominent for you in, in Ottawa now. Yeah. So, um, Auto, the big difference is Ottawa has a lot more emphasis on multi-use pathways mm -hmm. um, as, yeah, as a method of, yeah, like, I guess recreational cycling is, is a lot bigger in Ottawa, it seems, than whereas Montreal, it seems more like everyone bikes or a lot of people bike to get around doing everyday things. Um, so I guess that was the big difference is 
uh, less of a focus on city bike infrastructure and more on multi-use pathways, which is nice in many ways um, when you're along the canal um, uh, or, yeah, in different more more nature filled areas, I guess, is where um, Ottawa's bike lanes tend to tend to run. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a different experience. It's um, less of like hustle and bustle um, city biking experience and more of a laid back recreational riding experience. I would say in general. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So and when you, especially uh, as a female, when you uh, are experiencing this type of, of riding and the, this type of network, uh, do you have a preference? Do you, do you prefer, you know, you know, this, this kind of more, you know, um, you, you just said, you know, you're immersed in nature, it, which do you like better or, or do you, there are pros and cons to each yeah. that you can appreciate? Yeah, I think there's pros and cons to each. I think um, if you have a company over, like people who aren't super comfortable um, biking in in the city, I think multi-use pathways, the multi-use pathways here are are really great because it gets people out um, who aren't super into intense city cycling um, in a more safe, uh, or they they feel safer in that environment. However, I, I do prefer, I think, infrastructure built into the city more um, just because I find it more of an interesting uh, ride, although it is nice to have the option to have like a more relaxing nature ride sometimes. Um, I do prefer, I prefer like the ability to kind of bike, bike everywhere, I guess, <laughs> which is maybe a tall order. But, um, but yeah, I like the, I like the variance, yeah. variation. Yeah, the variation, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I'll cha- I'll channel the uh, uh, the the Finnish uh, episode that I just uh, completed with Pekka once again because what was really interesting about uh, Olu is that their network is you know basically ninety percent uh, separated off street network and they do everything they can to avoid having any conflicts and or mixing with motor vehicle traffic and whenever possible physically separating the network, um, you know, so that you can be in nature. And what was really fascinating for me uh, was the suburban context of what uh, Olu is like, because it's it really is one of those areas where, oh, my gosh, with North and North America, especially, we've been like frustrated and having a hard time figuring out, well, how do we make the suburbs work? And it's like, boom, (laughs) you know, if you design it right from the beginning, like they started doing, you know, 50, 60 years ago, um, they were able to, to support a, uh, a suburban context and have, uh, all of those, uh, cul-de-sacs penetrated by walking and biking, uh, you know, cut throughs and into a network of multi-use paths. And yes, the distances are longer than what you would have in, in a typical urban especially a denser urban uh, context where you you have a grid pattern, you know, grid system that you can rely upon, but dang, if it doesn't work. And as you mentioned, Patrick, they, they're the best in the world in terms of winter maintenance. And you, you will look at the amazing number of kids that ride in the wintertime to school. And you're just like, yeah, this could actually work. Now you two recently you know, produced an entire video about, uh, you know, this whole concept of, uh, of this type of bike infrastructure that needs more love. And it it really is all about this, you know, this, this concept of, yeah, I mean, you can, if you do them well, you can make, um, these types of, of facilities, these multi-use paths and these separated, uh, infrastructure, really shine. Uh, talk a little bit about the inspiration behind this particular video and I'll pull it up and, and we'll have it playing in the background. We won't have the sound, uh, but we'll have some of the images kind of hanging out there. Uh, talk a little bit about the inspiration behind this and, uh, and, and what did you learn at, you know, from you know, this process of making this video? Um, Patrick, I'll let you uh, dive in on that. So yeah, um, multi-use pathways. I definitely say that they're they're controversial at best among more serious cyclists who tend to prioritize um, going fast. Honestly, which is perfectly fair. You you get slowed down on multi-use pathways with uh, pedestrians and slower cyclists. But 
when you think of like a regular person, like your family member who's never really biked before, the context where they are willing to bike is this context here, where you have no no or very little interaction with cars, and you just have your your your, your complete your complete safe environment. You might be slowed down sometimes, but it's um, it's still overall a, a better experience for a regular person. And so I guess the, the the way we were thinking about it was that if we can take what people like about multi-use pathways, which is being completely separated from uh, from traffic, often they're they're very consistent across a long distance, which which is very useful. If we can take those and kind of build on that model and say fix the problem of of being slowed down by making them wider, um, and maybe even you know separate the pedestrian and uh, and cyclist parts of, of the multi-use pathway, you can kind of get the best of both worlds from from starting from this as a model and improving it instead of um, instead of uh, instead of starting from the model of the on street bike lane. So obviously it depends what kind of urban environment you're starting with. So if you if you're if you're you know building a, a new suburban development, you can start with with these multi-use pathways um, built in um, and probably what Olu does. Um, and yeah it's just People in the cycling community who are who are often interested in not getting slowed down by pedestrians and whatnot, understandable concerns. I think they tend to to not quite get how for regular people it's completely separated, um, no interaction with cars that really gets you comfortable um, on a bike in a city. Yeah, Jasmine, what, in making this video and putting this together, uh, what were some of the things that really uh, resonated for you? Yeah, I think going off what Patrick said, it's um, it's like is multi-use path, multi-use pathways can oft, often get forgotten. I think when you're looking at the infrastructure of a city, um, like biking infrastructure of a city, um, and yeah, to varying degrees, they can be a very valid addition to the network. Um, and yeah, I guess. Yeah, like they have their they have their flaws, but we like if we we want them to exist and we should yeah, we should be excited about them as we are other bike infrastructure, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, I know one of the things that that really kind of pops into my head as I'm looking at this and, and again, being right on the, the heels of of that conversation about the Olu paths was um, the fact that theirs are six point six meters wide. Um, you know, 22 feet essentially in change uh, wide. And so there's ample room for uh, the two-way um, cycling traffic and then also separated uh, pedestrian traffic. Uh, based on your experience, even looking at this image that we have right here along the waterfront, how much of a difference would that make for you in your cities? And, and you think about in the context of the Canadian cities that you're very familiar with. That would be excellent. Like honestly, a big multi-use pathway that big, it's basically a pedestrian and cycling only street. Yeah. And yeah, that, that, that's the, that's the, that's what you basically get. And which is an excellent idea. And we should be building to the extent that we can, we should be building our new developments around many of the streets being fully pedestrian and cycling only um, with car access only for maybe deliveries or, or, uh, utility purposes um, instead of having the car be the default uh, mode that dominates the street, which is not what you, which it does not encourage other modes to, to exist there as well. Yeah. So we've seen, we've seen a decent number of, um, this is showing up here, a decent number of, of suburbs in Canada. And this is in the, in the Montreal region that actually did a pretty good job of having these, uh, these multi-use pathways integrated into, into the, as their own separate network, Kind of, mm-hmm. there's a separate transportation network with the the cut throughs for the for the cul-de-sacs and and right. whatnot. So there, there there are going back to a point I brought up earlier about how we like to uh, to highlight how there are urban successes in North America that we can be inspired by and build on. Like many many suburbs do a decent job of this, and we don't just have to look to the the Olus of the world, even if they do a, a fantastic job. Obviously, there um, it's uh, it's often I guess what you find arguing for, for bike infrastructure in North America is people will often say, well, you know, that's the Netherlands, that's Denmark, that's Scandinavia, 
that doesn't apply here and they're wrong, most of it does apply here. But if you could also bring up an example of something closer to home, like you can say, it's like, if, if, if Montreal can have these cycling successes, if Ottawa, which is, which is, uh, doesn't even have the, um, you know, some people can dismiss Montreal for being, you know, it's French speaking. It's, it's a different, a different, a different, it's uh, a different world. <laughs> yeah. Different culture context. Some people can even dismiss that, but you know, you have yeah. Ottawa, Vancouver, um, obviously we focus on the Canadian context, but there are definitely lots of, of good examples in, in, in the U S as well. And if we can, if we can look to these, um, urbanism successes that already exist to, to show us that it's possible. And yeah, so we've done a, f- a few videos actually looking at uh, rates of, of bike commuting. So, you know, what percentage of people commute by bike and there is mm-hmm. a massive variation. You know, there, there are neighborhoods in, in most large Canadian cities where, you know, 10, 15, 20, sometimes even 25% of people bike to work. Yeah. And, um, those are the neighborhoods that we disproportionately feature in our videos as right. showing that, you know, these are successes in infrastructure and use, and uh, these can expire yeah. other places. And another thing we were talking about earlier today was how you'll often hear that, like North America, we don't have a bike culture, like a cycling culture. Um, but I don't know, at least for our experience was as children um, in rural areas. And it seems like in suburbs, too, that you do start riding a bike very young. Like, I think I started riding a bike at three years old. Right. Um, and so it's like most people have the experience of of riding a, their bike as a kid, at least. Yeah. Um, so it's really just, you know, continuing, like staying, staying on your bike. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the phrases I use uh, and, and I coined um, probably over a decade ago uh, as part of the Active Towns Initiative is is a culture of activity. And and really, you know, my intersection, my background is in health promotion and disease uh, prevention and the intersection of how our built environment includes or, or encourages and promotes a, a culture of activity. And so a, a big part of you know creating a quote unquote culture of, of cycling is is in fact, does, is your built environment such that it encourages it? I mean, really promotes it and supports it. You know, is it safe and inviting? Is it something where, uh, you know, like getting to um, a connected and cohesive uh, off street network, is it something that's going to support and encourage kids to be able to ride their bikes to the park, to school, to their friend's house? Those are, are, are critical um, infrastructure and built environment, um, you know, features that, you know, have to be part of, of our community. And um, what's interesting about your channel, and, and we'll pop over here to your landing page for the Oh, oh the Urbanity channel. Um, you guys are awesome, man. You're, 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 you're cranking this stuff up. Uh, I mean, this, it just blows me away. You just started this in 2020. Um, I started the podcast, uh, Active Towns podcast in 2020 as well. It was a pandemic project for me. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm, I can't be continuing to travel around the world filming my documentary that I was working on. Ah, I guess I'll do this. Um, so I love your channel. And what's really, really great about it is uh, also seeing sort of the evolution of your channel and some of the the earlier stuff that you did. And it seemed like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it seemed like in the early stages, a lot of the videos were very, um, were very transportation oriented and very, uh, you know, talking a lot about the cycling routes and everything. And then it, it's shifted even more into uh, really diving deep into some of the, um, the intricacies of of urbanism. And in fact, your most recent one with the, the anti planner and talking, you know, about O'Toole and all that. Uh, Patrick, why don't you talk a little bit about that evolution from your perspective of the early days and, and kind of where we're, you're at now and the content you guys are producing. So I guess you could think of it from the perspective of, let's say the, the early videos were showcasing Montreal in different, different, different facets of Montreal. And, you know, one big part of that was the, the housing situation, um, the missing middle medium density housing, which plays a lot into housing affordability because traditionally, as, as I mentioned, Montreal has been more affordable than other large Canadian cities. Yeah. Um, and as we, we move from, from, from that to addressing, you know, housing affordability and uh, economics and, and studies behind that more directly. And just because, you know, as most 
yeah, one of the, the biggest issues today, honestly, is just housing affordability and, and the crushing cost of, of, of rent, renting or, or buying a home and just opening up our cities to opening up our cities to allow more housing, allow denser housing, allow housing that, that supports walking, cycling and transit. It, it, it's good for livability, but it's also good for affordability. Um, if we, you know, stop requiring so much parking in, 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 in when you have this in the hey, we building. made it. How many minutes did we make it? We made it fi- 55 minutes before the word parking came up. Yeah. And- <laughs> but the interesting thing is that most people, I think most regular people just, yeah. they just think that the, the suburban style landscape that we have in North America is just, that's the, that's just how cities naturally turn out. Yeah. And whether you agree with it or not, it's important to understand that that is the, the result of lots of, of laws and policies yeah. saying, you know, you have to have a big yard. You yeah. cannot have a duplex here. You can't have a triplex. Um, you have to have parking for this number of people at your store using weird um, made up formulas for, for applying a certain number of uh, parking spots to a certain different types of stores. And we try to, to try to look into how these, we try to showcase the, these hidden rules that, that, that create our, uh, create our urban environments and have a lot of very negative impacts in terms of making people commute longer. Obviously, awful for the environment, um, for, for for affordability, for people's health. Um, as as you mentioned, the the, the side of, of of health promotion and just being able to be active in your community is such a it, it honestly underlies a lot of our channel because. The, from a certain perspective, our channel came from, you know, exploring Montreal. We love walking around. We love biking around. So that's what brought us into saying, that, okay, Montreal housing is, is, is pretty unique and interesting. And so, um, yeah, just being able, have, having the city that encourages you to walk and bike around, it's just, it's like, it, it's just amazing for your mental and physical health in a way that we, in a way that city planners especially in the more traditional style just have not recognized. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. You know, it's, I, I always laugh, you know, because it, I joke about parking, you know, coming up because it comes up a lot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a previous guest on the podcast, of course, was Donald Shoup, the the author of uh, the fabulous book, The High Cost of Free Parking. And he loves to say that, you know, free and, uh, inappropriately priced parking is like a fertility drug for cars. It just, it encourages more and more driving and all of the other things that you just mentioned in terms of the insidious nature of encouraging more and more and more cars, more and more driving. Um, What's interesting too is um, when we look at this, you you talked a little bit about, you know, the the housing challenges and the housing cost and and how much that, you know, inspired, a little bit of the direction that you have uh, you know, ended up taking and uh, that because that's the other side too is if if we if we don't get the the safe and connected cohesive uh, you know networks of bicycling infrastructure that makes uh, reasonable distances possible to meaningful destinations for people walking and biking um, then you, you need to have a, a different model. You know, if you can't have those, you know, the, the Olu type, uh, um, you know, connected, separated pathways, then you have to do the other model that we were talking, you were talking about there, Jasmine of, you know, you need to have a, a safe inviting network within a more urban context. And, you know, and then that brings us back to, uh, you know, that gentle density that we were talking about with the image, you know, of, of Montreal. Um, when you look at some of your, uh, more, more recent videos, Jasmine, um, and and where the channel has kind of gone to recently, um, from a content creator and somebody who's not coming from this background. And that's, I, I love emphasizing the fact that you guys are fresh blood. You're like new energy to, you know, for those of us who've been working in this stuff for decades and decades and decades, it's so cool to see the fresh content, the fresh energy, and the fact that your channel's blowing up. I mean, well over 30,000 subscribers so far. When you look at the, that most recent, you know, content that you're creating in this, in this new realm, what has you most excited? And what, what gets you, you're like, Patrick, hey, we need to do a video about this. Uh, talk a little bit about that. What's some of the stuff that gets you excited in terms of the, the content that you guys are working on these days? 
I think there's a, a lot of topics. Like, I think housing topics are the most prominent right now um, because it's an issue that everyone is dealing with um, uh, and that affects everyone's life, um, not being able to afford housing. Um, so I think having the channel has been a, a really good opportunity to at least try to at least try to help people see um, things from a new perspective in terms in terms of housing and like just to highlight like this is our situation right now um, yeah. and to highlight some of like the nuances of of things you wouldn't know unless you looked into this this stuff in terms of zoning and w what kind of housing is restricted in what areas and um, yeah I think I think if you if you haven't looked into it um, it's yeah it's hard to really know the situation and so I guess even just like from a perspective of us getting to research these things is really helpful for just understanding like our current housing situation and what can we do like okay so this is the situation and what are the solutions and even just being able to think about that is is really rewarding and um it just helps you understand the world better and so it's really interesting from that perspective um and hopefully can have an effect um in terms of making life more affordable for people um so if it has that effect at all that would be amazing <laughs> um but in terms of other topics um yeah i guess just just many things about walk walkability like walkability is a huge uh, i guess focus of mine um and just like how can we make how can we make it better to just like walk to the grocery store and not have hostile interactions with cars um things like that um and i guess just trying to look at look at these topics from a like you said like hopefully a fresh fresh perspective of like you know kind of being outsiders to the urban planning world um but yeah and just our own experience of walking around and yeah so i guess that's what that's what's the most interesting uh just like everyday observations that we have from moving around in cities and then like how that relates to the broader context of of housing and other policies yeah yeah yeah. And again, just the fact that a you, you you don't have formal training in this, and you don't have a deep steeped background in in this area, um, and you you sort of went down the rabbit hole, <laughs> you know, and uh, and started you know getting you know ver well versed in this. And you guys do excellent research, and you are well versed in this stuff, which is super super cool. But it's got to seem like you're drinking from the fire hose at times. <laughs> Patrick, speak to, to that a little bit, and uh, and. And, and sort of pivot a little bit and talk about this, which is one of your most recent videos that's doing quite well and, and what you guys were uh, trying to really drive home on this. So I guess one of the, the, the fundamental, the fundamental issue that we, that we focus on is how you cannot avoid the fact that if we want housing to be more affordable, we have to build more housing. <laughs> and there are so many different ways that people try to, obscure that fact or they're, they're, they're not aware of the, of the research and the studies showing that there is a very, very clear connection between you know, housing construction in some places. So like in, in Texas, um, despite all the, the issue, many issues with sprawl, they do a pretty good job of building new housing. It's not necessarily the, our preferred type of housing, but setting that aside. And as a result, you know, Texas is, is, is more affordable than you know, a place like California which makes it harder to build housing. And yeah, in, in, in this video, we try to show, we try to address some myths about, uh, about, about housing. So you can see here pretty clearly that, you know, if you have low vacancy, most of your apartments or houses um, use occupied and it's, it's, hard to find a, it's hard to find a place, that corresponds to high prices. Because, you know, if, if a landlord has, you know, dozens of people applying for the same apartment, they decide the price, they can discriminate on other factors too. Um, and basically, uh, you know, if, if you are hoping to get an affordable, uh, decent place to live, you don't want to have to compete with a bunch of other people for the same, for the same home. And yeah, we also try to, as um, inspired by this uh, heading that just came up, we try to, I guess, broaden people's perspective when it comes to housing affordability. So a lot of people just forget that renting, that a lot of people rent, uh, they have, you know, a lot of cases, good reasons to rent. 
And people just think of, 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 of affordability in terms of the price to buy a home. And, you know, it's, it's understandable that lots of people prefer owning that. That's perfectly fine. But, you know, when we talk about, let's say, like, get housing investors out of the market, they should stop buying up, uh, buying up homes. It's like, well, if you want to rent a place, you need to, you need to rent it from, you know, a small scale or, or a large scale, you know, quote unquote housing investor. And, you know, if, if, if we somehow make it impossible to, to rent out units, to rent out homes, then, you know, that, that's awful for people who, you know, need to move for a job or are students or um, have all sorts of other reasons to rent. Like we rent, it helps us, you know, we don't know exactly where we want to live in a few years. And it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a positive to our life to have the option to rent and in the housing affordability debate, a lot of people just forget that renters exist. And yeah, those are some uh, key, key um, misconceptions that we like to talk about in our, in our videos about housing and housing supply and renting and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. And, and Jasmine, you mentioned it earlier, too. Uh, it, it's like, you know, what, is, what are the zoning laws and what is allowed to be built <laughs> is, is a big part of it. And uh, so often in North America and, and many, many cities around the globe, um, you know, we've made it difficult to build that middle missing middle housing and the, the, the high housing types. And, uh, you know, one of our biggest challenges here in Austin is it's really easy relatively speaking, if you have the funds, uh, to build luxury uh, towers and luxury condos that uh, will eventually sell, you know, between, you know, three million and, you know, $10 million. And it, it, and they're, you know, maybe occupied, you know, a few weeks out of the year uh, versus it's really, really hard for us to do that beautiful missing middle, you know, fourplex, you know, type things and the, and the, and, and the four story stuff in, in a region that's adjacent to single family households. And so it's, it, it's tough. We've done it to ourselves by the, the, sort of the rules that we've set to play, you know, and all everything. So um, what have we not talked about that you want to leave the audience with? I guess we touched on it to some extent, but I guess just the, so we went back and, and visited Montreal for, for a weekend a month oh. or two ago. And it just, it really stood out to us just how much the, the environment, it, it's, it's not just, you know, it's not just the distances in being, being closer. Right? So, in, in Ottawa, we have a, a relatively uh, decent distance for a walk to a grocery store, but it's not as pleasant as, as, as Montreal. So in Montreal, our walk to the grocery store was along the um, Mont Royal uh, Avenue pedestrianized street. Right. Uh, that's pedestrianized for, for much of the summer. And so like the experience of, it's, it's, it's very striking having the experience of, of walking down a pedestrianized street like that every day yeah. to, to get your groceries, go somewhere else. And then, to have that go away when they when they brought back the cars for 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 the winter, yeah, it's you, you don't realize how disruptive cars can be until they're taken away and then brought back. Yeah, I'd like to say from a behavior perspective, uh, it, it's that difference between saying you're able to do this versus it's a it's a delightful experience to do this. You know, right. it's like oh, it, the difference between yeah, you're able, you know. Theoretically, you can do this uh, versus a true invitation. It's an inviting environment. Right. All right, Jasmine. And, yeah, I know something just, came to your mind, so go right. for it. He sparked, he sparked it. Um, yeah, and I guess just, yeah, really just going off of that, um, it probably shouldn't feel so, you shouldn't have to feel so on alert when walking in a city right. to get to a like somewhere you have to go every day like a grocery store or or a cafe or or work like I like I'm very aware when I'm walking um because I don't want to get hit by a car and we're in the fairly car centric area um and I think that just adds like a level of stress to your life that you really shouldn't need um so I guess I would just say like, yeah, I, I guess I just hope that people can at least try to imagine a world without one or two cars in their household and like imagine the experience of someone, someone who walks everywhere and like 
try to be more aware of of people walking <laughs> and and biking around a city and yeah. um yeah you know yeah yeah <laughs> well, my final thing is where I'm going to queue up uh, your folding bikes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also a folding bike guy. Um, whenever I travel internationally, I have my Brompton with me and and, and, and domestically, too. Uh, I love to. Well, in fact, one of the videos that I produced was me riding from various uh, airports I, I'd fly into. And I love to, to to depart and arrive to the airport by bike. Talk a little bit about what folding bikes have meant for the two of you. So I guess the, the, the thing that's often underappreciated is just how flexible and versatile bikes can be. So cargo bikes are, you know, amazing for, for getting groceries or whatever, or whatever else you need to, to, to carry. But folding bikes were, were especially useful for us because, so we lived in a Montreal walk-up apartment on the, uh, on the third or fourth floor. We had our, our external staircases, which was a nice, relatively convenient way to, to get to the ground. But carrying up a, a full-size bike um, every every day was uh, was not very pleasant, and uh, it also took a lot took up a lot of space in our in our apartment. And so, folding bikes just they they address so many issues that people can have in terms of you know if you don't have bike parking at your work or safe bike parking, maybe it's it's there, but it's uh, you worry about your bike getting stolen. Um, there's a decent chance you can take a folding bike and, and fold it up and put it in your office and don't have to not have to worry about uh, about getting stolen. Uh, it takes up less space in in your in your home. It's just I think part of the part of the process of developing more of a bike culture in North America. And as Jasmine said, I think we do have a base that we can work with in terms of, in, in terms of uh, people being relatively familiar with bikes. Part of the process of developing a bike culture is understanding there are different types of bikes. You know, it's not just a, a road bike that goes really fast, which lots of people enjoy. Nothing wrong with that. You know, there are the more upright Dutch style bikes, there are cargo bikes, there are folding bikes, e-bikes. We haven't really talked about e-bikes on our channel very much. We don't have much experience in that area, but it's definitely a it definitely fulfills a, a big um, a, a big a big. Uh, it's a big hole in terms of, uh, of utility, I guess. And uh, yeah, I think folding bikes are underappreciated. They maybe aren't the best for covering long distances, although even then they can do pretty well, um, so better than people might think. But uh, yeah. yeah, folding bikes are underappreciated. So Jasmine, for you, uh, the folding bike, how has it helped with your ability as a couple to, to, to be able to create content when, when you guys need to travel and you're, you're just like, okay, we, we can do this. Yeah, it's, it's pretty convenient. Um, we've taken in them on trains a few times, I believe between cities. Um, and yeah, we're actually heading on a trip next weekend where, um, my family's driving through our, the city and we're probably just going to throw our, um, bikes in there and then be able to bike around in the in the city so right. um yeah it's like it, it really opens up a lot and just like i think patrick said before like it's like a really good range extender um and when it's small and compact it's even easier to <laughs> to throw it in and um and also yeah at, um when we were in montreal i would quite often use my folding bike if I wanted to go to the grocery store, but I didn't want to have to worry about locking up my bike and I would just fold it and bring it into the store. Right. And, yeah. uh, and it's like very, very possible to do it. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. And, just like and a great up. conversation yeah. piece. Yeah, it's true. We had a lot of people yeah. ask us about yeah. them. That's what I was going to say. Fantastic. Montreal, we got yeah. so many comments. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, I can't think of a better place for us to wrap this up. Jasmine, Patrick, it has been such a pleasure having you on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so very much. Thanks for having Thanks us. For having us. Awesome. Yeah. Everybody, make sure you get on over to their channel. Oh, the Urbanity. It is a fabulous channel. Lots of cool stuff, especially, you know, most recently really diving into the intricacies of uh, urban challenges that are out there, especially housing. So get on over there, give it a check out, like and subscribe. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Cheers. Guys. Thanks, guys.